the best leadership is the self leadership that's what that's it that is a quote by robin sharma in his book the leader who had no title hello good morning afternoon evening everyone joining from across the world today i have a special guest a special women leader who's going to tell us about her journey and i'm pretty sure we are going to have a lot of fun welcome shilpa thank you haritosh for inviting me to this talk i'm so excited to be here sure i am also very excited so let me tell you a bit about former so it's more of a question and answer session i'll be asking a few set of questions and uh, you'll you'll be giving some on answers to that and if any audience have any question they can put it in the comment box and then we'll see if we can take some questions towards the end all right okay um, so let's let's start with your uh, journey uh, would you like to talk about how did you start and where all you have been and what all things you have done in brief sure um my uh, journey started i would say in bangalore india uh, mm -hmm. i am originally from bangalore and uh, i used to see my dad work in a factory as a child and i always thought i should do that i should work in a factory i should create these machines you know that looks really complicated and very interesting for a child so eventually that led me to pursue uh, mechanical engineering um, mm -hmm. at bangalore university uh, during my undergrad the the fact was that i was one of two women in a class of 200 men <laughs> so it was just me and the other girl it was a very crazy situation for me because although i was so um so interested in this engineering career i saw there were so few men, women in in that field even mm -hmm. as a college student um it it was quite a difficult journey in the beginning eventually i did get used to it so i finished my undergrad in bangalore and then i had these a lofty goals that i want to study in the us i'm going to get my masters degree here in robotics and control systems so i came here to the united states uh, in 2000 that, that was 20 years ago wow. and i uh, i uh, finished my masters degree here that was another challenge because it was you know a different culture different place different climate uh, different food everything different you know it's the other side of the world so basically it's basic it's like the other side of a coin uh everything was different no family had to make new friends <laughs> it was sort of um tough but made me very resilient to other things later on in life mm -hmm. and in my masters degree i was the only female wow. in an entire class of around 60 uh maybe 55 60 people mm -hmm. i was the only female throughout um all my classes so i had a tough time somewhat relating to my other classmates and they had a tough time relating to me i really had no other girlfriends in my class uh huh from there on i go on to uh start my career and i started working in a small r&d company uh in oklahoma i worked there for a year and a half uh that was just me working on a project so there was no one else Mm -hmm. uh, again i was alone there and then i joined an automotive company uh called sandin international mm -hmm. uh we made compressors for the ac um systems for the car and truck market mm -hmm. so i designed and developed those compressors tested those compressors and so on uh for you know german american car manufacturers uh japanese car manufacturers like volvo volkswagen honda gm mm -hmm. you name it um <laughs> all the Nissan all those companies that was a fun like 9 years of my career even there i was having maybe one other female engineer in our engineering department that's wow. about it there were about 55 total uh, number of people in that department so one of two women engineers <laughs> fast forward from there i go to um emerson electric Uh, I worked in the automation solutions uh, group 
uh, for the regulator technologies division. And there I was a senior engineer developing um, midstream natural gas pipeline pressure regulator. And in the oil and gas business, it's very conservative. It's um, somewhat old fashioned. And again, I did not have any, well, maybe but one or two other women engineers in our group of maybe 150 to 200 people mm. in that group. From there, I did that for three years or for about three and a half years. Um, the pressure regulator I developed, by the way, is now powering Manhattan. So the natural gas that flows through uh, the, the, the regulator I designed is now um, installed in the New York power uh, station. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just one of those, you know, proud moments of where yeah. you see your products, like the cars and the truck have those compressors and the, mm -hmm. the pressure regulator is now powered in New York. And uh, then I go to Cummins. I moved to Indiana from Texas. So all my previous career was in Oklahoma, Texas area. Mm -hmm. I uprooted everything uh, from Texas, moved to Indiana to a small town from Dallas, Texas, and also to <laughs> the Midwest and colder weather, which was a little challenging for me. I am not yeah. used to driving on ice <laughs> at all. So I'm, I'm a Texan by heart. So I, I started working at Cummins until uh, recently. And here I was uh, developing uh, the uh, 3,500 horsepower engine for a mining application. Um, again, I was in the leadership team for Cummins. Um, Cummins is pretty diverse, uh, better than most other companies, yeah. uh, but still there were uh, very few women, especially mid-career and about that, in, you know, mid-career, uh, mid-management and executive management still has far less women than we should. So right now, um, I am looking for new opportunities, uh, trying to steer my career into another direction. But my journey uh, over the period of last 20 years has been kind of um, almost, I feel like I'm riding solo <laughs> with hardly any other partners or, uh, or uh, the, the camaraderie that usually men have in the workplace or in school was very hard for me to get because uh, being a woman, I would feel uncomfortable and the others would feel uncomfortable as well. So there you go. That's my journey so far. Wow, that, that's such an interesting and yeah, I, I can quite correlate uh, when I was studying in my engineering in between 2003 to 2007, we know we had, sorry, a lot of girls in the computer science and IT uh, department, uh, electronics and telecommunication had little less, but when it comes to mechanical and civil, they were almost, almost nil, uh, one, one odd girl. So I think you have been going through that one odd cases, but I, I must commend you. I mean, yeah, working in a place where you have, you have only one or two more women for last 18, 20 years is really a commendable job. So well done, I must say, well done to you. Uh, so my next question is that, no, uh, and it is probably related to what you said. Uh, why do you think there is a lack of uh, women participation, especially in mechanical, civil, electrical, engineering? I see there is a lot of diversity in IT and electronics now coming up. Why do you think there is less in, in those core skills? Uh, I think, first of all, the perception is that it is tough. Uh, these uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, civil, these uh, uh, maybe to some extent industrial is very hands-on and you have to uh, use your hands to build things. Uh, you have to work on a car, for example. Uh, you have to go work under uh, the hood of an engine. So it seems uh, it's, it's difficult. That's one perception. Um, and we do have to do um, things like run a lathe. In, in school, they teach you the, the skills of the trade, right? So you, I have run a wooden, wood turning lathe. I've run a regular lathe. I have run a CNN, uh, CMM machine. Um, all kinds of, um, even foundry. I have 
cast bolts in a foundry with sand casting, carried liquid uh, metal uh, from a furnace and all that, and used a sledgehammer to make uh, a bolt. So that kind of thing. So it's it's tough, but it's not uh, it's not not impossible. It, it is possible if you are determined to go through the motions and and just mm -hmm. do it. So I was determined enough. And I think why I was so determined was um, people challenged me. So when I um, got into undergrad uh, at, in India, uh, the first couple of days, every professor that saw me in the class would come up to me and say, why are you taking up mechanical engineering? Why not something else? And that just made me think, why not? Why not? Right? Yeah. Like, oh, whenever someone asked the first female pilot or the first female astronaut or first uh, female, you know, um, Navy person, for example, like, and what, I would think, why, what would they say? They would say, why not? I mean, if I have the intellectual capacity to do it, the physical power to do it, then um, I should, you know, challenge the, state, the status quo and just try uh, to be successful. So that drive to prove everyone that I had to be successful kept me going for the last 25 years, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's a tough deal, but it's, and people always question, relatives, friends, uh, your classmates, your professors, the society in general questions. Um, I even had uh, one of the um, career fair um, interviewers come to college and say women are not going to be hired in this power plant, so please don't apply. Um, and that made me say, okay, I'm going to a place where open discrimination is not going to happen, and that's why I moved to the U.S. Mm. I, th I think this is a very powerful story, like, and we can all correlate to people who did the first thing. It's very easy to say, okay, you, you can't do that because it's never been done. But at least there is somebody who can say, yeah, this is the first time I'm going to do that. And I think this is a very inspiring story. So thank you for sharing this. I mean, you are an inspiration for a lot of people. And, and thank, thank you. you. So uh, in the, the next question I want to ask about is, and I think probably it's going to be much related to your career again, is you know, uh, we talk about success a lot. But I, in my show, ask people about their one or two failures when they experience failure and what were their learnings from that? So do you have any failure to say and, and what did you learn from that that you want to share? Sure, I can talk about, uh, about a couple of instances. Uh, one is in my uh, term as a senior engineer at Emerson, I was given a project which was uh, halfway through. Uh, so I got on the project at maybe 60% completion and I was new to the company and I was told, oh, the project is done and we have all the calculations ready. You just have to finish it out and close out the project. So I thought, okay, that's great. And I gave our uh, project managers um, an estimate for how long it will take to finish the job. And later on, as it turns out, I dig in deeply into the, um, the documents of the project and find out that actually it was not so complete like they thought it was. Mm -hmm. uh, the calculations were either invalid or were missing information. And it was just maybe 10, 20% complete, ra complete rather than 60% complete. Mm -hmm. But my, uh, <laughs> my initial assumption was wrong and I had now committed to a timeline that was impossible to achieve. Um, this made um, management kind of mad at me because I did not estimate properly and it was my fault too for not having uh, gone deeper into the, uh, the case study to see if what they were saying was right. I just took it at face value. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this delayed the project, of course, and later we caught up uh, after some delay, it, it was all done. But the lesson I learned was I should make sure that uh, when I give an estimate, you know, it should be accurate enough where I should be able to follow through uh, for that. If I need to go much deeper into the project, I should. Uh, it, is, it is one of those um, things that I, I try to follow now since. So, so what I'm hearing is that, no, 
as a, as a leader at times you need to do your due diligence uh, you you can't just take people things or other resources for granted you have to do your due diligence before you sign off or you know, finalize anything from your end uh, otherwise you can be taken off guard at times yeah i i want to be held accountable for what i say that i will do um uh, and to be accountable what i'm going to say it it should have merit it should be achievable and i want to uh ensure success by being more um diligent with with my work um the other failure i would say is well it's not a failure but it is something uh i should have done a long time ago but i did not was a network so since i had the challenges of being a woman engineer and just being able to survive was such a such a fight on a daily basis i did not focus um on networking and i was also a very introverted person and very uh, nerdy just wanted to like read books and do things on my own and want to hide it, hide in a corner so that personality did not help either and i did not understand the power of networking until much later in life and i see that as somewhat of a failure on my part to to ramp that up and build my network early in my career thank you i think that that's very important yeah we all need to have our networks and connections that helps us uh, in a legitimate way so yeah a very important point so uh, i know in your profile that you are toastmaster so how did you come across toastmasters it's a, it's an interesting and rather an embarrassing story so i'm going to tell it to you anyway thank you <laughs> i was <laughs> uh, well i've always been um, very scared to speak in public and i was also um, uh yeah never participating in anything where i would be on stage uh, throughout my childhood and early adulthood so when i um joined the society of women engineers much later in life and i was moderating uh, a session um uh, in the conference the, so the conference is huge thousands of people come to this conference and i was moderating a session of five panelists and i was um in front of about 300 people and me who was so scared to speak in public had finally determined that i would go out there and try to do it but it was a large step for me so i went out there and when i got on stage and started to speak i looked at the people and one glance made me how cold sweats and i thought i was going to pass out so i held the podium because i was going to black out and fall but i held it so tight that i i couldn't i wouldn't fall because i held it so tight and then eventually a few minutes later i kind of uh started talking again and um it went through i just got through it somehow that day i decided oh i need to do something about this this is crazy this is so abnormal so so many people are able to talk on stage and why not me so that was uh that was there then a year later when i was asking one of my mentors to tell me one thing that i should do to improve myself and out of nowhere she said you are good at many things but you should try toastmasters mm. and then it, i connected the dots yes i had this ridiculous fear of speaking in front of people and now someone who really hasn't even seen me speak in front of people said that i should do it so maybe i should just do it when i came to uh, indiana uh, seymour uh, where i used to work there was no club i started looking for a club there was none it had been shut down from a lack of membership for a few years mm -hmm. so uh, myself and a few others got together and chartered uh, the seymour toast masters club and ever since my life has taken a, a positive turn i have so much in, you know enjoyed see uh, see more toastmasters participating in the speeches uh, learning how to talk my icebreaker again i was shivering my icebreaker speech was um you know yeah. had a lot of <laughs> with me feeling so scared 
but after several speeches now, I feel much more confident and I've, I've served now as vice president of membership and president of the club. Mm -hmm. And this year I'll be serving as area director of Toastmasters for Indiana as well. Wow, congratulations. I think you're doing an excellent job and I think uh, Toastmaster changed my life as well. And there are millions of people for, for whom Toastmaster has been a life changing thing to happen. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm indebted to Toastmasters for a lot of things, communication, leadership, and so many other things. So, yeah, I totally agree to you. You also you. mentioned about that. Uh, my next question is related to some non-profit work that you do. So you want to explain about that? Yes. Uh, so my non-profit journey started with uh, Society of Women Engineers. I Before that, I was you know, always trying to hide under a rock and not try to talk to many people or do anything outside my comfort zone. Uh, once I got introduced to the Society of Women Engineers much later in my career, I, um, I first attended their meetings. Uh, thought, wow, this is a great group of people. Similar to me, I can network, I can make friends mm -hmm. um, and learn. And then slowly I started taking on some roles I uh, worked, uh, I, I did several uh, roles within the, the SWE uh, organization, such as being a counselor for uh, Collin County Community College uh, in mm -hmm. McKinney, Texas, where I was coaching uh, students on uh, how to do interviews and, you know, introducing them to companies and things like that, coaching robotics uh, teams and uh, volunteering for their Design Your World event where we bring STEM awareness to little girls like, that are about 13 years old and their mm -hmm. parents about how a woman or a young woman can be an engineer. So we try to be role models and show them the different fields of engineering and things like that. So I thoroughly enjoyed my uh, volunteering with SWE. I also uh, was their uh, scholarship reviewer for the Dallas area and I also reviewed scholarships for the national committee. And also I was on the finance committee nationally. Um, so did a lot of different uh, work for them. This, for, this, uh, this year I will be the LCC coach, which is again, coaching the uh, different chapters of SWE. After SWE or while I was at SWE, I started uh, also being on the North uh, Texas ASME group. Uh, I was on their leadership board. Uh, as a secretary and university relations uh, officer, where I would, uh, you know, bridge the gap between universities and professionals and try to help mm -hmm. each other arrange professional development events and um, play the role of secretary for our meetings. I now serve as an involvement chair for SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers for Indiana, and I'm on their board as an involvement chair and I do their social media for them. I was also um, a board member for the Chamber of Commerce in McKinney, Texas. Uh, so this was called RAM, uh, McKinney Women's um, Alliance Group. And this was uh, women in business and we would help market their businesses and, mm -hmm. and product in, in the area. So they were local business women and entrepreneurs. Um, so, and then I have Toastmasters, like I already said. Mm -hmm. We, going through all these different organizations and uh, serving in, in those organizations, what I discovered was the servant leadership um, you know, method of leadership. So servant leadership is uh, all about the other people and the goal is to serve. It's different from a top-down approach. Uh, it's all about being humble not abuse authority, being a, a good coach, uh, having leadership with integrity, being collaborative, trusting, and being able to listen. So when you're in a, volunteer, a voluntary organization, you cannot say, hey, go do that, because yeah. I said so. <laughs> that will never work. So yeah. you have to try to you know, uh, influence yeah. that work getting done. And that's what I've learned. And this helps in, the, in my actual career as well, because a lot of times I have to get things done by people that don't report to me. And how do I do that? I lead by influence. 
if you want to be a project manager in many organizations, they don't have direct reports. How do you do that? You lead by influence. So the servant leadership methodology has really helped me be a better person, grow professionally, and just uh, be the, the authentic leader that I want to be. Yeah. Um, also, it gives you uh, the, the nonprofits, um, technical or other organizations, give you so much opportunity to, to interact with a variety of people or companies and uh, learn so many new things that is just out of scope in your just day-to-day -day career. So overall, I've really enjoyed it and um, love doing it and will continue to put in all my energy into that besides my career. Right. I, I think, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad that I asked. I mean, you have been doing a lot of volunteer work and, and this is such a great thing to know. And yeah, just to add to what you said to servant leadership, I was going through a leadership training and there they said the servant leader is the one who, if required, can actually serve tea and biscuit to their team because they are there to actually serve the team to basically make sure that their teams are able to perform to the best of their ability and they are as a facilitator as as the one who will organize and make sure there are no impediments to their progress so so great job and, and i think yeah that's how you do in non-profit organization and if we can all inculcate in our day-to-day -day work we don't really need to use our authority or power or misuse rather uh, i think this is the best form of leadership servant leadership so uh my next question to you is, uh, since you have done so much about uh, women uh, leadership and, and uh, women in, in STEM and all, uh, if you have to give a few tips to the young professional and maybe in, the, in your case, especially to women professional, what would those two, three uh, tips would be that will help uh, make their career better? Okay. Um... For a young woman uh, who is still not in college, I would say, yes, there may not be role models for you in some areas, but nothing is impossible if you put your mind to it. So there are so many things you can pursue and you may be the first and you may not travel on the path that is you know, well-trodden, but it is important to you know get to that destination even though you have to cut down the weeds and trim your path yourself mm -hmm. so nothing is impossible and with some sheer determination you can make things happen if you want to be the first astronaut in your family or in your state or in your country you can mm -hmm. be you can be that and sure. more power to you so go go do it go find your way uh, for the women who are already in a STEM career, who are already in leadership or management positions, I would say help, help your, um, your other, other women in, in those careers. Pull them up. Give them a seat at the table. So there is a saying, if there's only one woman in a boardroom, her voice may not be heard. If there are two, they, they can project on each other, but if there are three, then definitely they, their voice can be heard. Mm -hmm. So you see in corporate America today, or pretty much everywhere in the world, you will see that uh, the executive team or the board of directors will mostly be not you know, diverse, and we'll see very few females or none at all. So what do you need to do? You know, as you grow through your career, I would advise or suggest these other women who are successful to pull along other women and other minorities, not just women, even other minorities to, to go up and just uh, you know, break that gra glass ceiling and change the status quo. Very nice. And I, I think yeah, uh, you did rightly pointed right. It's not only women who need to pull women, it's, it's also the men. It's not only about the white or black or Asian or any ethnicity, we all should mm -hmm. learn and help each other. So that would make this world a, a much better place. Okay, so. I want, can, can I add one more point? Sure. So the diversity um, or uh, you know, bringing more women to the table, 
bringing other minorities to, to the table is not just for like a diversity and you know to make some things look more equal that is there but also when when you have a diverse group people from different backgrounds and ethnicities they bring different ideas mm-hmm. and they they grew up a different way mm-hmm. from this other person they bring a perspective that is not possible to get mm-hmm. other so and b- by those perspectives that means you can solve a problem for your business from many different angles and you can find the most optimum solution so it's not just to make it make your company look good but you can also affect the bottom line so yeah. that is why it is important to have a uh, a diverse team of leadership and a diverse team throughout the organization i totally agree yeah. everybody comes with their own yeah, mindset their own perspective so and that brings the best out of everyone so totally agree okay uh, so we are i think coming towards the end of the session uh, and my last question is about the elephant in the house <laughs> which is the corona so how are you dealing with corona and covid 19 I think it's a global pandemic. So. Yes. So Corona virus uh, ruined my plans to have a vacation in Greece this year, and we were supposed to be on a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. And luckily, we had to call it off before we would get stranded on a cruise ship. You know how how that has unfolded uh, mm-hmm. recently. So corona virus has uh, wreaked havoc on everybody's lives um many people have lost their lives and it's it's a terrible thing but what i want to say is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger so if you know if you survived or if i survived if all of us survived this this horrible uh, pandemic then we will come out stronger and we will start thinking of new ways of life maybe you know businesses will uh will uh, try to have less office space and you know more flexibility in work from home and mm-hmm. and and things like that education is going online and businesses are going online and the world is changing as we know it so i think even in the light of the pandemic there are some positives and i want to look at the world in a positive light i'm a glass half full type of person yeah. so i think i think we'll get through this hopefully in a couple of months um yeah of course i am bored staying at home all the time so i just go around you know stroll around a park or something here here yeah. and there once in a while to keep my sanity but um eventually it should we'll find a vaccine we'll find a cure we'll get yeah. through it and then we'll we'll uh, keep our learnings from it not forget them all right thank thank you shilpa this was great talking to you i, I learned a lot of things and and very interesting thing and i'm pre- pretty sure you have broken the glass so many times in your life and you will continue to do that uh, thank you for joining us uh, i'm going to in the show now as yeah, i do thank you yes Thank you Haritosh for inviting me. This was uh, my first time on Instagram and uh, again I learned quite a bit on how to get live on Instagram. Uh I had a really great time talking to you. Thank you again. Have a good day. You too. Have a good day. And I'm going to end the show as I do every time that let's all help each other uh, in this time and when I say help it's not always about money. It's also about talking to someone for a few minutes. It's also about feeding a pet. so let's all help each other and let's continue to keep learning keep growing and keep going out of our comfort zone this is haritosh and this was episode 11 of instagram inspiration with shilpa nagraj i'll be back next week with another personality looking forward to take care god bless you all thank you sir